through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by Brenda Strong and Jesse Matkeff. I'm assuming I'm pronouncing those right. I have one of those names that gets mispronounced a lot, so if I'm wrong. It's pretty close. Okay. Yeah, good job. You, you can't really do anything wrong with strong. Yeah. <laughs> if you're you'd pronouncing that wrong, like, <laughs> you really have a problem. You'd be surprised. I've done, I've done some weirder things before. You guys are in town uh, to help promote the relaunch of Dallas, which is, as you guys were talking off camera, a continuation of the series, not a reboot, but it sort of focuses on other characters as well from the original series. Um, I guess I have to start, though, by talking about the fact that both of you guys worked on Desperate Housewives, as well as, was it Josh Hutcherson? Henderson. 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 Um, you got, so there's three people from Desperate Housewives. There's a slew of people from the original Dallas. Is there a rivalry going on? <laughs> no. Well, I don't think so, because uh, Housewives is off the air, so there's, there's no rivalry. <laughs> no, I think the only thing that, that those two shows have in common is that they, they both started with D. Um, the fact That's that three of us are on that show, Cynthia Sidre said beautifully, it just shows that we have good taste in actors, which, you know, she said the, the characters who got cast were the best ones for the roles. So Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. Yeah. Is there, is there any sort of, uh, I mean, now that you, uh, ignoring the Desperate Housewives connection, is there any sort of, you know, newcomer aspect to it? Because I, honestly, I, I mean, I was probably too young for most of Dallas. I, I guess I was about 10 when it ended. I didn't realize that it went on for 14 seasons. I didn't realize that it was 350 episodes. Mm -hmm. Do they look at you guys coming in like, oh, those are the new little punks on the like, campus? <laughs> like, we've been here for 300 plus not, episodes. Not, not at all, actually. They, they were very welcoming, very supportive. I mean, Larry, Linda, and Patrick are three of the most gracious people you know I've ever had the privilege of meeting or working with. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it wasn't that type of scenario. I think I think they knew they, they know what it takes to make a long-running and successful series mm -hmm. and it's ha and it's having that you know family bond between the actors you know and having mm -hmm. great chemistry uh, on set and I think they tr they tried to recreate that with the new mm -hmm. series and, and I think it worked you know and I think they knew that that with this upgrade with this updated kind of contemporizing I, I, like, of, I like the word upgrade which is <laughs> Dallas 2.0 yeah. um, they were aware that there's room to share um, the lay of the land, and and certainly, you know, above and beyond them being being workmates, they're best friends. Mm. They they have been close ever since, and so they they are extremely generous and welcomed us as as Jesse said with open arms. How how conscious were you guys of the original Dallas going? I know I saw that you apparently <laughs> had a little cameo role in the original version, but like. <laughs> When, when you're even being considered for this part, how far down that rabbit hole do you go? Because I have friends who try and get me to watch like Buffy and Angel, mm. and that's 12 seasons of a show. This was 350 something episodes where you're just like, I'm gonna sit down and watch as many as I can, or did you just try? I, I, don't, I don't think you go very far down the rabbit hole. I, I, I certainly didn't, <laughs> you know? I mean, like Brenda was saying in another interview that we did fairly recently, you know, she didn't wanna be she didn't want to be too influenced by the original series. Mm. And also being that both of our characters are, are relatively new characters. Obviously, Christopher was introduced in the original series, but, you know, first as a baby yeah, and then as a, part, as a yeah. toddler, you know. I mean, th there really isn't much information to draw on other than to see exactly how dysfunctional his childhood and his upbringing might have <laughs> yeah, been. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which <laughs> obviously we see from the original series, it was incredibly dysfunctional. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that sort of stood out to me as I, like, powered through all the seven episodes I watched in one day. For you, Brenda, you kind of had that strange role, and granted, this is through the first seven episodes, so there's probably more that's going to happen, but you sort of had the role of playing, like, the straight man. I guess that's a comedy term, but you were sort of the normal one in the in the show, and there's something relatable to me about that because everyone else is so crazy <laughs> that it's almost like you need that sort of sense of normalcy that there are like normal people in the in this world, and it's just not madness everywhere. Well, I think Patrick said it beautifully. He said, 
Bobby and Anne have to be the moral compass for the show. Oh, they have absolutely. to be the heart center. Everything else, I, I think of it as a hub. We're the hub, and all these spokes are just spinning out of control around us. But we have to hold down the fort. There has to be a sense that this is normal, and, and we are relatable, and people do want to be us. They want to be this functional, you know, loving couple. And, and we kind of have that... that um, responsibility to the show and and as much as you think Anne is normal yeah, wait wait say, till you get see get off the your other, high horse Brenda wait till you see the other episodes because <laughs> Anne isn't quite as normal as she seems and that was what was nice for me is that that as Jesse said in an earlier interview you know there's shades of gray and with yeah, every wow. you know someone I knew used to say the bigger the front the bigger the back well Anne has a pretty big front so the back's got to be pretty interesting which means she's got some secrets in her closet and it's definitely hinted upon as the seven episodes I saw were and I mean, I guess you're sort of in the middle of that spectrum of gray, especially because, you know, you definitely believe in your mother and father. You definitely sort of follow their guidance. But at the same time, you're you're so protective of everything that you kind of begin to drift into that sort of gray slash black or whatever you want to call that territory. What is that sort of like being the, the I guess, the middle of the sort of pendulum that goes back and forth? Because you have much more moral centered people and <laughs> some people who don't seem to have any moral center at all. It's a lot of fun actually, <laughs> you know, because my character is constantly in conflict. You know, he also has a, a, a strong moral center, but he's often questioning it, you know, because mm -hmm. he, he, you know, so desperately wants to succeed. You know, he so desperately wants to prove himself. He so, so desperately wants to be accepted, you know, a, as a Ewing and, and, you know, really assert, his, assert himself in the, in the Ewing family hierarchy. So, you know, I mean, he's constantly, you know, questioning his next move, whether, whether he should stay on the side of right or whether he should compromise his, his learned values, you know, the values that his father taught him and, you know, go to, go to the darker side. Fight fire with fire. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's one of those interesting things, you know, because... Watching the show, and I mean, one of the things that immediately occurred to me was how intense the show was. And this is even from somebody who enjoyed shows like Lost, but it felt like, and I've described it to other people, is basically you guys are full throttle the entire time. Like there is no sort of like release. It is immediately from like tense moment to have that, that's Dallas 2.0. Yeah. You know? Have you ever driven an electric car? I have not. But okay, I so Jesse's character, yeah. because because Jesse, you know, is a, a alternative energy. alternative energy um, guy. Dude, he, he yeah. dude, he <laughs> drives a Tesla, and I I've had the privilege of driving a Tesla. It's like our show. <laughs> it's like zero to sixty in three point four seconds. It's fast. Well, what is that like as an actor? Because you know, me watching it, I'm just like, Jesus. I'm like, do I have to pause the show to get a break? I mean, do you guys feel that way on set? That is just so. Well, much you ca you kind of do, but as an actor, that's what you want. I mean, you mm -hmm. want the stakes to always be high. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, you know, from that from that perspective, it's great. But I mean, you know, just speaking from my own experience through the first season, um, you know, it, my character went through a lot, you know, and was really on on the emotional edge pretty consistently throughout the throughout the first 10 episodes. So, uh, you know, it, it can be it can be a bit draining, but I think the uh, the finished product was worth it. But I also think, you know, audiences are so sophisticated now. Audiences are used to a lot going on. I mean, all you have to do is if you're a fan of Homeland, there's a lot going on and people can follow it now. They, you know, my son's generation, he's used to being on his phone, being yeah. on his iPad, watching television and writing a theme paper at the same time. So having multiple <laughs> plot lines intersecting is not going to be distracting for him. Oh, no, you're so I think the younger audiences are actually going to appreciate it. You're absolutely right. And it's sort of one of those things, though, that, you know, talk about sort of processing. And this was kind of a concern that I had going in. And kind of one that I'm still sort of working with a little bit, but I'm curious to see how it evolves. And that was the immense backstory that existed before the show. Because, like, the first episode, I admit, I was like, okay, how is this person? Like, I, I, like, I, I was sort of thinking a little flow chart in my head. <laughs> and it, as, as it went on, it sort of started to come together more and more. But how much do you guys, you know, think about that kind of stuff as you are working on the show? And do you, do you guys actively try and make it more easy to process for newcomers because I'm sure I'm sure there's a huge portion that's going to be original fans the, coming The in. new series we believe stands on its own without ever having seen a single episode of the original mm -hmm. Dallas. Um, but ha having having said that, I really feel like the original series really just gives this built-in rich history 
that that just brings so much more gravitas to the new series. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is that TNT is actually showing a lot of those earlier episodes. So if the audience, once they get hooked on the show, wants yeah, to go back and see what JR was doing back in, you know, 1980, well, it's, it's um, so they'll have the opportunity to. It's so funny for me to think about because, you know, as I said, like, I was not super conscious. Like, I had heard about who shot JR and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I didn't realize that was like season three of the show. Like, it went on another 11 seasons after somebody shot JR. And the, what is it, the... The TV movies. I'm, and... try, I'm trying to think of like the one of the episodes. I think that. Or do we do, we, we don't talk about those. No, sorry. no. Well, that, well, that, <laughs> like, no, stop yeah, bringing that's, those that's up. All their cameras. I watch the Saved by the Bell movies and stuff like that, so I'm not above some TV movies. But I guess the the cliffhanger with Who Shot Jr. was the second highest rated uh, TV show episode. I mean, ignoring Super Bowls and stuff. And the number one, if you ignore the Mash finale, right? That that really. I mean, the the profound impact that this show has is kind of amazing. Think about it. how is that for you guys coming in that there's so much interest in this series and so much history with it that it's sort of like do you feel pressure to live up to a certain level with that? Yes, I think I think we do. I think we all have a deep respect for how beloved this show was before and that we don't want to disappoint the audience. And I remember the funny thing that you say about the Who Shot JR episode. They shut Broadway down. People wouldn't go to the theater that night, so they just made it dark because they knew people would be home watching because, you know, DV DVRs or VCRs weren't that popular back then. So so it had a huge impact, and he was on the cover of Time magazine and, and on and on. So, yes, we I felt a tremendous it, amount something. of pressure coming in, yeah. but I think some of that pressure was relieved because Larry, Linda, and Patrick mm. were on board and because they carry that that weight with them, just inherently being in the room with them. That history is living and breathing in this present moment in time. And it kind of eases the pressure a little bit. As you guys work on this, how what is the process? Because there are so many twists and turns. Like it was one of those things that literally every <laughs> by every commercial break there's another major twist happening. Are you guys like totally conscious of what everyone else is doing on the show or is there certain element of surprise that you guys have. I mean, do you know, like, oh, two episodes from now, blah, 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 is going to screw me over? Well, no. Is it, is, it's no, because, surprising. I mean, you know, we get the scripts one at a time. We don't mm -hmm. get the scripts ahead of time, mm -hmm. as they do with most television shows these days in order to keep the storylines as secretive as possible. So, But one of the things I have to say to that end is that every time I got a script, I would read all the way through and see what everyone else is up to. But for me, being able to see it, in the first seven episodes that they released to the press was amazing because I got to see how it got lifted off the page. And I was so impressed with my fellow castmates and what they did with what I got to read. And then when they brought it to life, I went, wow, this is much more dynamic than I thought. And one of the interesting things, I mean, I guess the original <laughs> Dallas deserves, deserves a lot of credit for, you know, the concept of the cliffhanger and the, the importance of, like, leaving people wanting more. Do you guys feel that there's any concern about there being too much of the twists and turns because in the first episode there's a character who triple crosses people basically by the end of the episode and I, 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 I mean it's interesting it definitely keeps you on your toes but I was just like whoa, whoa, whoa. I, like, yeah, I, whiplash I mean, yeah, the, the, the double cross doesn't work anymore yeah. so you gotta go to the triple cross well, <laughs> you know quadruple is gonna be season <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's, like, it's like an Olympic gymnastic move the quadruple double cross and I, mean, I mean obviously there's definitely a market for it because Dallas lasted 14 seasons and that mm -hmm. was sort of a staple of it but how do you sort of keep it from going too far or being too crazy that people are sort of like overwhelmed by how many there is. I, I think the new Dallas is far more rooted in reality, even than the original series, mm -hmm. really. I mean, this show really is at its core, you know, about this dysfunctional family and their and their interpersonal relationships. Are you saying right now there will be no dream year? I, I, no I, I can say 100% <laughs> there is not going to be a dream season. <laughs> <laughs> or hopefully no. it happens after no. I'm off the show. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What do you think about, you know, the process of updating this for the next generation or modern times in terms of, you know, as you said, he's the alternative energy dude mm -hmm. and the sort of battle of that in addition to the oil rights and mineral rights and all sorts of things like that. What do you think that brings to the show? Do you think that speaks 
more to the times that were yeah absolutely. absolutely it makes it contemporary and, and I, I mean do you like how do you sort of balance that in terms of the history of the show being so oil weighted do you think that you have to sort of pull back on that because people no. perceive that as no. like evil now or Not no a, i time, think it, it just time, Times, 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 have times change, and the shows change with the times, you mm -hmm. know, and then that's and that's what makes it still relevant. And know? I think that's the conversation that's out there right now: is how much more can we deplete the planet of its resources without being responsible for it? And and it that battle is being waged within this family. I think the and geopolitical why, yeah. and environmental battle is actually being waged in the Ewing family, and I think that's what makes it very relevant to to what's going on on the planet. What is it like, you know, actually working with, you know, Patrick and them? Because it's, it's, I mean, they seem like they'd be phenomenal to work with. And it's probably a really amazing experience for these people who lived the story for so long. Is it, is it an experience, sort of like a learning experience as much as it is just a fun opportunity because they've done so much? I mean, it's, it's funny to me to think of somebody like Patrick Duffy because I grew up with him mostly on Step, step by, by step. step. And so to think that, you know, he was on another show for 14 years before that mm -hmm. is incredible. And you guys, I mean, you guys have done a fair amount of TV work between the two of you. Mm -hmm. um, Sports Night, by the way, big fan of that. Thank you. That um, tells me how smart you are. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, I mean, do, do you guys, even as people who have done so much work in your own rights, still learn from these people who have been around forever? I mean... Absolutely. I think we all learn from each other. Um, and as the craft evolves, as you evolve as a human being, I think, you know, through osmosis, you kind of learn from other people's approaches to acting. Not any one person has the same approach. Everyone kind of gets in their own way. Or the perfect approach, you know. I mean, right. You know, and that's, that's the thing about acting is that you're constantly learning and you're constantly honing your craft. Mm -hmm. You know, but I mean, Larry, Linda, Patrick... And Brenda are really, you know, I mean, because obviously those are the people that, you know, I look up to on the show. I mean, they're not, they're not the type of people to, you know, give advice unsolicited, you know. And so, so it's really, I, I've learned from them just by observing them, you know. And that's, that's what you do. You, you do, you lead by example. And that's what the three of them have done really beautifully is lead by example. And that's very nice of you to include me in the, of in the old camp. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, like I'm, I'm, I'm including you in the accomplished camp. Thank you. you know? I mean, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, what, what was your impressions, though, you know, working on a show that was on, I don't know what it is, even basic cable. Is that even a thing anymore? <laughs> like, I mean, you guys have done so much on major networks mm -hmm. coming into this. Were, were you, was that a factor in sort of deciding to be on the show because you're able to do so much more? I mean, FX, for instance, is so intense. AMC is doing mm -hmm. so many amazing things. Was that something you're like, okay, maybe this will let us... I don't know, spread our wings or whatever cliche term that you want to use for that too. I, I, I do like the less is more approach. I, I like the fact that these cable networks do fewer episodes at a higher quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I think they it, give their writers a lot more time to be in the rooms prior to shooting. I know with, with our show, I can only speak to Desperate Housewives because that's where I've been the last eight years. The writers were literally chasing their tail. Um, you know, they were just trying to get get to the next episode by halfway through the season because 23 episodes, that's a long haul. You can't prepare that many episodes in advance. And by the time it airs, you're already just trying to get the lead on the next two in front of you. So I think, I think it does help for the quality of writing, certainly to have less episodes. They could get a, bit, a, a bigger lead on where they want the season to go. But for us as actors, I think it also opens up, you get to do more kind of salacious things. Um, you can you can swear more. You can get away with a lot more, you know, sex and viol violence. Not that you want to have those things in your show, but at least there's not someone, there's not someone saying, no, you can't. Because in Desperate Housewives, you'd be surprised how much money was spent on erasing things that weren't supposed to be there. So... It's nice to have a little bit more freedom. Well, that, uh, that's an interesting to think about. You know, I mean, presumably, maybe on the DVD versions of Desperate Housewives, things could get a little bit more raunchy or whatever. Is there is there a lot that is sort of I don't know cut out or is going to be added? You know, after the fact for the DVD releases, that isn't. Yeah, there'll, there'll, there'll be a lot of added scenes, a lot of deleted scenes in the DVD. No doubt about that. That's fantastic. Yeah. And you know what? What is your sort of perspective? of Dallas as a whole. I mean, what were you guys thinking as you sort of came to this project? Were you of the mindset you were like, 
any opportunity you're going to check out, or were you or just like this is a franchise that's so noteworthy that I want to be a part of it, or this? I think I think we about? all respected the franchise and knew how successful that original mm -hmm. series mm -hmm. was. But I mean, I, I I think I can easily say we all had our own. Um, amount of, he of hesitation. Mm -hmm. Trepidation, for sure. Yeah, definitely, because, I mean, you know, remaking, remakes, you know, I mean, for, obviously that was, the, that was the word on the tip of our, even our tongues and on the right. tip of most of our critics' tongues as well, until we discovered that it wasn't a remake and it was actually a continuation, mm -hmm. you know, but bringing a show as iconic as Dallas back to television, is that a good idea? And I think for me, I, I had a great deal of confidence in Michael Robin, our executive producer, director, and I had worked with him on Nip Tuck. And I felt like if anyone can shape this beautifully and update it and keep it kind of tonally correct, but at the same time exponentially more interesting and um, kind of entertaining, it, it was him. And so I felt very comfortable in his hands. And he, he proved to be quite the auteur. Uh, you mentioned sort of the dirty word, and I mean, I guess Hollywood in general, just sort of remake. What is it like to sort of combat the preconceptions that, you know, it is a remake, all remakes are evil, like, I'm, I'm sure we're, that's we're, something we're, you get. We're definitely, con we're definitely conscious of it, there's no yeah. doubt about it. But I mean, I just liken it to my own experience when this opportunity came across mm -hmm. my desk, so to speak. You know, so I mean, I can, I can speak really directly to, the, to possi our possible critics in saying, I had the same experience, now tune in, give the show a chance, exactly. and, you, as, and you will also change your mind just like I changed my mind when I read that pilot episode. Yeah, my feeling is give it a chance, watch it, and the proof is, is in the experience of Proof's watching. Proof's in the pudding. Proof's in the pudding. <laughs> Good old Texas saying. <laughs> yeah, Nikki. into you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Dallas. That's like something you say on Dallas. The proof's in the pudding, Christopher. <laughs> yeah, well, get, get proof's in the pudding. That's all I'm going to say. You know, season two. <laughs> you guys have it premiering TNT June 13th. Is there anything else you guys want to promote for yourselves? Anything else you guys have coming up or anywhere that people might be able to find what you guys have coming up? Twitter? Website, oh anything? sure, I you know I I am I am the newbie on the block for Twitter Twitter. So if you want to follow me, you can go to Brenda underscore Strong, and you're if you want to follow me, you can go to at Jesse Metcalf with an e on the end. Don't spell it wrong. Has an e on the end. And if you're missing <laughs> if you're missing Desperate Housewives, I've just started voicing a new series on Discovery called um, F Blood Relatives, um, which is kind of one of those crime real life reenactment dramas which is kind of interesting sounds sounds cool yeah hopefully the ewings won't be one of them <laughs> no blood on our hands and you just did you have anything else? you know i mean this this uh this press tour for uh for our premiere has been keeping me incredibly yeah, busy I but i obviously i'm definitely looking for the next thing a uh, quick side note i saw that there was a desperate housewives video game <laughs> any chance that there will be a uh you know, Dallas video game? Go on to TNT. They actually have not a video game, but they have a kind an of a, an interactive, an interactive game rise that, to power that, that game where you can, you can choose. It's, it's almost you like fantasy choose, football. It's you know? awesome. It's like fan, fantasy yeah. viewings. So you know? follow us. <laughs> just pick your characters. Just us. Nobody else. Yeah. Just follow us. Yeah. <laughs> the Chris Ewing. The Ann Ewing. Hashtag the Chris Ewing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I will be checking that out. Uh, Brenda, Jesse, thank you so much. Thank and you. Check out more interviews at MacGuffin Podcast. Come. Two thousand can't stop me. I'm fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to bite the side. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.